Now, when we saw the types of segments in some of our earlier sessions, there was something called a confirming segment, confirming code segment and then we have been talking again and again about call gates okay? and those two parts are very, very important from a security point of view because those are the things that are going to allow a numerically higher level code segment to transfer control to a numerically lower level code segment. Okay? So, these are the two important constructs that can make uh, that can make or kill security. Okay? So, so, let us understand this in a proper perspective and when we actually do uh, an analysis of an operating system in terms of security, specifically from an x86 point of view, these are the things that come very, very deep into it. Okay? So, let us take this. There is a control transfer from a code of some PL, some privilege level to another code with some other different PL. Okay? We have talked about same PL already. Now, we are talking about one PL and another different PL. Now, we can use confirming code segments for doing this or a special segment descriptor called call gates. We will see what are those things as we uh, proceed in this session. First thing is, what is this confirming code segment? See, the confirming code segment is a code segment. But it will have its own privilege level which is do not care. Right? The adjective confirming itself says it confirms to something else. What does it confirm to? What do you mean by confirming to something else? Right? Let us look at that in detail. So, if a control transfer happens from segment S, some segment S to a confirming segment T, the privilege level of T would be the privilege level of S. Right? So, the confirming code segment confirms with the privilege level of the calling code. So, if a control transfer happens from privilege segment, uh, from segment S to a confirming segment T, the, now the privilege of T will be the privilege of S. Right? You are, you are getting this point? Right? So, now T will start executing as if it is a privilege level 3 code. If you, if you are privilege level 3 and you call me, I am a confirming code, I will start dancing to your tune. You are privilege level 2, you call me, I will start dancing to me. Okay? Right? So, so, now this is, this is very interesting. Now, again I leave it as a simple exercise for you to find out where will we be using these things. Where will a confirming code segment becomes, become important. I okay? will just leave it as a simple exercise. Right. Think about it. So, these are the ways you know you may come out with a different answer than what I have. Okay. Now, the DPL of confirming code segment descriptor should be less than or equal to the CPL of invoking code. Right? This is very interesting. Therefore, CPL equal to 2 can invoke a confirming code segment with DPL equal to 1. Normally, CPL equal to 2 cannot invoke code with DPL equal to 1, but if it is confirming, I can invoke it with DPL equal to 1. But CPL equal to 2 cannot invoke a code with DPL equal to 3, because that means that three le I, I have myself classified it as a 3 level code and now it starts executing at privilege level 2, I do not know what will happen. Right? So, please note that even if I am talking about confirming code, I am putting lot more restrictions there. Right? So, because the confirming code is written by me as an operating system. Right? So, I know what it can do. So, even if worst case the three fellow comes in, I have privilege level 2 and I have done lot more of stuff. Right? So, I am having, so a confirming code segment has a strength of being in privilege level 2. So, if it is not privilege level 3, I do not care. So, a 3 fellow can come and access me. Please note, this is a very conceptually different part. But when I am writing a confirming code segment, which is at privilege level 3, 
it has the strength of being only at privilege level 3, it cannot execute at privilege level 2. That is what I am stating as an operating system when I say the descriptor for this code segment is 3, essentially means this confirming code segment can work only at 3. Now, when a 2 level fellow calls, that fellow will start executing at privilege level 2, which I do not want, right. So, the descriptor privilege level of a confirming code segment should be less than or equal to the current privilege level of the invoking code, right. This is because I have written the confirming code segment and I have given it enough strength to be at that level. So, anybody above that level, uh, numerically higher than that level comes and executes it, still it can stand that strength, okay. But anybody from lower cannot execute it because it, this segment itself according to my definition is not capable of executing at a level lower than this, right. And that is where your DPL plays a very close role, right. This is another big role for the descriptor privilege level where the operating system can express itself saying what is the strength of this code in terms of which privilege level it can execute. Are you able to follow this? Okay. Why? <coughs> so, that whatever I have said, why CPL equal to 2 cannot invoke DPL equal to 3, right? That is what, if not you jump back or return to the source code segment after executing the invoke code segment, this should permit return from a numerically low privilege code to a numerically high privilege code without check. So, Essentially, this is, uh, uh, if you read this again and again, you will understand what I have. If you have followed what I have lectured, then neglect this sentence. If you did not follow, uh, you know, look at the video plus this, so you will follow that, okay. But do you all understand what is confirming code segment? Okay. Ah, now comes the next. So, what is this trying to do? This is one way by which I could come from a numerically higher privilege to a numerically lower privilege. There is another way of coming from a higher privilege to a lower privilege, wherein it is not confirming, right. It is not confirming. So, the lower privilege fellow will work at that privilege level only. In the previous case, what I did, the lower privilege level, the, the confirming code segment will work at the privilege level of the higher fellow. So, I, if I am a PL2 code, you are a PL3 code calling me and I am confirming, I will start working like PL3. But in this call gate, I will work only as PL2. You can call me and I will start working at PL2 and I will give you the answer. But I will not change my privilege level to 3 and work, okay. So, this is the difference between confirming code segment and call gate. Now, <coughs> what happens in this call gate? This is the descriptor of this call gate, which essentially gives me <coughs> yeah. yeah a selector which is 16 bits, please note the second field. This is a selector of the code segment and then the offset within that code segment which is 32 bits and there is a P comma DPL here. This is the system descriptor, okay and there is a P comma DPL uh, with the present bit and the DPL bits, okay. Now, what happens is <coughs> the DPL can tell me so, this is a descriptor available in the uh, GDT, it cannot be in the LDT, right. So, please note this cannot be in a local descriptor table, this will be in a global descriptor table. Again, there is a level of protection there. Now, what does this say? You are a PL3 code, you want to execute some PL1 functionality, maybe a system call you want to execute. Then, what you do? I as an operating system has designed that system call. So, when I design that system call, I have taken lot of precautions so that information does not leak or you do not do any damage when you execute me. <coughs> then I give you an interface that is called call gate. In that call gate, so I am a code segment, I have a descriptor, I will store that descriptor in that call gate that is called the destination selector the index of the descriptor in that destination selector, correct? And then I will store an offset within that where you can start executing. So, when you just call this particular index in the GDT or you jump to this particular index in this GDT, what will happen? 
this particular destination selector will be taken, that core segment will be taken, that core segment's base will be taken, to that base this offset will be added and you will start executing from that offset. And after you finish, you go back to the original thing, right. So what I have done here, I have basically said that I am a routine, I have very high privileges and you can use me, but you have to come through that gate. You cannot use me as it is, you cannot use everything of me. You can come through a specified call gate and in that call gate, it will give access to me, but only to some part of the code because I have put the offset there. So you can start executing exactly from that offset and go back. So I also define an entry point into my code. You can't come and arbitrarily enter my code. I will define an entry point. From that entry point, you can go and go off, right? And when that is getting executed from that entry point to that, it will work in my privilege and you will go back. So can you give, him, give me a very interesting example for this? An interesting example for it is password, right? Now password is to act, is, is to, uh, to access an uh, file, right, which is, which is read and writable only by the administrator. You can't read and write, no? If you look at the password, you know, if you look at the uh, uh, access permissions, access rates for a password file, a normal user cannot read and write. But what you are doing, you are changing your password, so you are actually writing into that file, correct? But only the user, only the super user can have, have read and write permission for that file. How are you able to go and access and read and write into that file? You are reading your password also, right? How, when are you reading a password? You type something, it will get hashed and that hash is also read from there. Similarly, you are writing into your password. How is it possible? Though you do not have read write permission, right? This is a way. I am just telling, that maybe this, I do not know how Linux has implemented this, but this is a way we can implement. So, there is a password executable program, which is user level program. Now, that is stored in some code segment. Now, when I type password, that particular program, there it, it offers a call gate. So, I go to that call gate and there is some specific things I can do. I will go and that, it will start executing that password program from that particular entry point. And that call gate is defined by the operating system. Right? It will start executing from that point and it will execute. It will change, it can change because it is now privilege level 0. It can change the file and it will give me back. So it will take the value from me through the call gate, it will go there, go and execute that program, do the whatever thing at that privilege level and come back. So this is very, very important. Otherwise, every time I have to change the password, <laughs> I have to, to tell the password to the root and he will change it for me. And if the root is your friend, quote unquote, you are done for, okay? So this is very, very important. So this call gate descriptor, uh, this is one example where we can use call gate. I do not know whether operating system uses this or not, but this is very interesting. Yeah. So what we have done in this uh, set of three to four slides is that how will a privileged level K code call a privileged level K minus one, K minus two code, right? And please note that we have lot and lot of privilege checks that happen here. It is not that you just allow it, right? And when you really want, when you really want this uh, whole thing to be much, much secure, all the confirming code segments, all these segments that are subjecting itself to a call gate type of access should not be changed. So you sign these functions also. Right? You sign these functions so that they never change. You have done it, you have done some verification saying that it is secure. Now you sign it so that every time it gets executed, the sign is basically being checked. So there cannot be some modification to this course which will allow you some penetration here. But these are all very, very important functions, especially the call gate. Now, another interesting point about this call gate is there is a DPL there, if you look at that. Right? So, this call gate cannot say, just I have a call gate, anybody, any Tom, Dick and Harry cannot come and access it. If I make DPL equal to 2, right, only 2, 1 and 0 can use my call gate, right, 3 cannot come in. 
if I make DPL equal to 1, 3 and 2 cannot use this call gate, 1 can use it and the other code will be 0, so 1 can use to come and execute 0. If I DPL is 2, 2 can come and execute something in 1 or 0, right, if, three, if it is 3 then anybody can come, right. So I also have one more level of protection there using the DPL which says that though I am a call gate, I am open for higher privilege levels to come and execute to come and ask me to execute from some point, uh, from the given point, but it is not that every fellow can come, so I have some control there through this DPA, okay. So, so many small interesting things are part of this, uh, uh, you know, privilege switching, which we need to understand and implement it. <coughs> Okay, so so calling higher privilege level code. This is this is what I've just uh, summarized. What is this? So so I di directly will not go to the code segment and uh, code code segment descriptor. And then I'm talking over the incorrect part. The segment is not directly to the code descriptor. It it doesn't point to the code descriptor. Rather, it points to a gate. And that gate will tell you uh, what is the uh, selector plus offset, and that from the selector I'll get actual code segment, and it will go. So there is a gate which will tell me which code segment I should use, and what is the offset. So there is one protection that is given here. I now directly go to the code descriptor and go to the segment and start accessing it. This is not possible for going calling higher higher means numerically lower privilege code. So this is, this describes the call gate. So the call gates are defined like segment descriptors, they occupy a slot in the descriptor tables, they provide the only means to alter the current privilege level, right, to, to, and def, they, they also define entry points to every privilege level. So if you are privilege 2, I can go here, privilege 1, you can, so I can put different call gates for different things so that, uh, you know, I can have different entry points here and must be invoked using a call instruction because I have to return back, you can't jump to me, right, I, I know I should know how to send you back. Okay. Ah, so please note here, your call gate accessibility is your target DPL, target, so there are, please note very carefully, there is a gate which has a DPL, there is a code descriptor which has a DPL. First you come to the call gate, there is a DPL there, then there is a code descriptor that has a DPL and there is a CPL. This is called the gate descriptor privilege level, the whatever is there in the disc code that is called the target descriptor privilege level, okay, right. So there is a current privilege level which I am executing, there is a gate DPL, there is a target DPL of that. So, so your target DPL should be less than or equal to max RPL comma CPL which should be less than or equal to your gate DPL. So I can only through a call gate go to a descriptor privilege level that is less than me, hmm? less than me or max of RPL comma CPL and, and to go to that I go through a gate and that gate should be at a descriptor privilege level which is larger than me, larger than me. Okay. So, for example, if CPL equal to 2 and the target PL equal to 0, you should use a gate with PL equal to 2 or 3, then only it will uh, it will allow you. If you use with PL equal to 1, the gate will not allow you. So, gate will check you if you do have enough privilege and the target should be at a lesser privilege than you, a lesser or equal privilege than you. You can't jump again for the same reason, I can't use a call gate to go a higher privilege. The stacks privilege level will always be equal to the current privilege level as I told you when I like to lo load a stack segment, the privilege level should be equal to exactly the same privilege level. So when changing the CPL, the processor automatically changes the stack, okay. Why it changes the stack? Where will it get the stack? For every privilege level, there is a 
stack available in the task state segment. And we have already seen why this is important because from a security point of view, this becomes extremely crucial. So the base of the TSS is stored in a task register. The task register points to, which is updated by the privileged instruction, what you call as LTR. So TR actually points to, what will it point to? It will point to a selector, uh, a TSS selector in the uh, table. From there, it will point to a TSS descriptor, which will point to the base of this. So essentially, from the task register, you can basically get the base. The task state segment associates a stack for each code for each of the privilege levels 0, 1 and 2, right? So that is very important. 